of liberty. There was free talk in the old New England town hall and around the cracker barrel of the crossroads store, and there was free talk from men and women every Thursday at this time. As the National Broadcasting Company presents another in this new series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. Tonight, the Council offers this fifth program with a special pleasure, because on Tuesday of this week, as a salute to Democracy Luncheon at the Hotel Astor in New York, the Women's National Radio Committee awarded honorable mention to this series. Madame Yolanda Mario Irion, who announced the award, said, and I quote, Our local committee was also enthusiastic about two programs on NBC, introduced too late to be included in our annual ballot. We shall live again, and speaking of liberty, end of quote. Both these programs are sponsored by the Council for Democracy. And now for the discussion of this evening, led by our host, Rex Stout. You may know Rex Stout as the creator of that distinguished criminologist, Nero Wolf. On these programs, speaking of liberty, you will get to know him as an outspoken champion of democracy. Mr. Stout. Thank you, William Abernathy. What we try to do on this program is to remind our fellow Americans of the fact that they have fingers and toes, and of the reasons why fingers and toes are good things to have. That is not a desperate attempt to be whimsical. While many of us are acutely aware of the moth holes and shiny spots in the fabric of our democracy and insist that they shall be repaired, we are also accustomed to the garment itself, its quality and warmth and convenience and the charm of its style that we take it for granted. We are so comfortable in it that we don't even notice that we have it on, and we refuse to entertain the possibility that someone could tear it off of us. It is as much a part of us as our fingers and toes. As I say, we take it for granted. The people of Norway and Denmark and Holland and Belgium took it for granted, too. And now they are naked, shamefully and miserably naked. The Council for Democracy, believing that Americans are profoundly and passionately attached to their great social and political freedoms, pays tribute to these freedoms on this program once each week by inviting a distinguished guest to speak of them in the light of his or her special knowledge or experience. This week it is her, for our guest is Miss Fanny Hurst, the novelist, and her distinction reaches that rare altitude where no introduction is required except to pronounce her name. But, Mr. Stout, I don't pretend to a special experience in democracy. But you do have a special experience in the art of storytelling, Miss Hurst, and I hope you'll talk about that. Well, yes, like you, Mr. Stout, words are my stock and trade. But first I want to talk to you about one word. It's a noun. It's a common noun but at the same time a vibrant, beautiful, important, and revered noun. And as a writer, I am a little on a persnickety side about keeping the value of this word intact and precise in our language. And I'm referring to that blessed word, democracy. Here's what's happened, I think. This word we all use so easily has been repeated, reiterated, and shouted about, tossed to us so constantly during the period the world has been in such grave trouble, that it's lost its sharpness. Yes, and there are times when it must cut. Sometimes I wonder if some of the alarming lethargy with which America seems to be coming awake to the thunderous fact that our way of life is no longer secure may not be due to the fact that we are not as sensitive as we should be to the potency for the individual American of that word democracy. As a writer, I'm naturally interested, especially in individual lives and the impact of events on them. Let's try to dramatize the word democracy a little, Mr. Stout. All right, you make up a story that'll do it for us. Give us a set of characters and tell us what happens. Well, let me think. All right, let's take an average family. Let's call them old Mr. and Mrs. Brown. How's Mr. and Mrs. Calvin Brown? Ladies and gentlemen, meet the Calvin Browns. How old are they, Miss Hurst? Where do they live and what do they do? Time out now while I think again. Well, Calvin Brown lives in a typical American town like millions of other typical Americans. Let's say, how's Middletown, Indiana? They have three, no, let's say four children who range mm, between 17 and 25 years of age. Calvin Brown, the father, is a claim agent for the town's transportation system and he makes about 1500 a year. Ouch, with four <laughs> children. Tell us about them. Well... Charlie, the eldest, is married and lives with his wife and a baby in a nice bungalow on a nice street in Indianapolis. 
where he has his own business. And it's a small business, but Charlie's building it up. Good for Charlie. And the others? Well, now, back in Middletown, the daughter Marion lives with a family and is studying law at the State University. She expects to graduate next year and get a job with one of Middletown's leading lawyers. Then there's George. George has worked himself up to assistant manager of a local hardware store, and George, I wish you to know, is about to marry the daughter of the boss. That leaves one to go. I think you said there were four. Well, Theodore Teddy, as his folks call him, is also attending the State University, and Theodore has just won a scholarship to travel abroad. There you are, Mr. Stout. Meet the Brown family. Ma and Pa, three sons and a daughter. Pleased to meet you. And what happened? Well, now, first of all, there's the wife and mother, Mrs. Calvin Brown. Let's call her Mary. Mary Brown realizes that the family needs extra money to put the children through school and college. So she capitalizes on one of her assets. She begins making homemade cakes and cookies, going into partnership with the woman next door. And between them, they've worked up quite a business. I take back the out. Now, both the Indianapolis and the Middletown Browns have a radio... A car, a washing machine, and a piano. The old folks have a little shack on the riverbank on the outskirts of their town. And summer weekends, they pile themselves, the Airedale Terrier, and provisions into the car and go out to spend a couple of days along the peaceful shores of the river. The sign over their little shack reads, Happy Days. And right there is the springboard of our story, Mr. Stout, from which I leap into plot. It's a nice way of life. It's a social design that a novelist about to write of this kind of group as it exists in a democracy would confront as she begins to plot her novel. And where does the question of democracy come into the story? Well, now, before I answer that, let's change the scene, Mr. Stout. No, I suppose not so much the scene as the atmosphere. Let's keep the setting, but imagine that the country has gone totalitarian. Let's drop in on the Browns. They're still in Middletown, still in their pretty home, but no longer citizens of a free America. The dictatorship is gone, and the Browns are now subject of an autocratic power. Thank heaven this is fiction and not fact. Oh, agreed, but let's imagine it just the same. At the moment of our visit, a cloud considerably larger than a man's hand hangs over the family. Calvin Brown has received a summons to report to the local office of the political police for a remark he is alleged to have made in a public restaurant. Also, it appears that their next-door neighbor, you remember, the husband of Mary Brown's partner in the bakery business, has disappeared for reasons completely unknown to anyone, and the Browns are terrified and not without cause. In addition, Teddy, he's the boy who won the fellowship for study abroad, has just been told that for no reason which the government does not see fit to explain, he will not be allowed to leave the country. And he has nothing to say about it? Nothing whatsoever. And, of course, Mrs. Brown has closed the bake shop. As a woman, she isn't allowed to remain in industry. And for the same reason, Marion suddenly realizes that her law degree is nothing but a piece of paper. Under the new laws, she can't practice law. So now we come to the other boys, George and Charlie. George was in the hardware business and about to marry the boss's daughter. Right. From the point of view of a writer, Mr. Stout, the material I would now have to work with where this boy and his fiancée are concerned is rich in its tragic possibilities. But from the point of view of a human being, the material is heartbreaking. A few weeks after his marriage, George is informed that because of the new racial laws which bear on the family of the girl, the government will not permit the marriage to take place. That leaves Charlie. He's already married with a baby. Yes, Charlie. Well, over in Indianapolis, Charlie's wife is expecting that other baby. And Charlie is working hard in his spare time on a nursery addition to their pretty little bungalow. But ironically, on the very day their second son is born, Charlie receives word that he is to leave home at once for Texas, somewhere near the Mexican border. Receives word from whom? From the government, quite arbitrarily. You see, Charlie is a chemist, and his little business has to do with chemistry and dyes. And the government needs chemists for work in a secret laboratory on poison gas, and so they take Charlie. And what happens to his wife and children? Oh, they get along as best they can, but at best it isn't for very long, because very soon Charlie comes home. 
He's brought back two months later, totally blind as a result of an explosion in the laboratory. The sole redeeming feature to all this misery is the fact that the father dies in a concentration camp without ever knowing. So here, in a novelist's nutshell at least, is the difference between a living, breathing brown family in our democracy and the potential brown family, God forbid, which would exist in a totalitarian America. And there are many, Miss Hurst, too many, who have not yet realized the possibility that the democratic way of life as the Browns lived it may be snatched away from us. As I said, we are so accustomed to the quality and warmth and convenience of our garment of democracy that we take it for granted. We don't even notice that we have it on. And we scornfully dismiss the danger that it may be torn from our backs and soon, soon. There you have touched upon the greatest perils of this imperiled moment, Mr. Stout. One which I wish we had the time to also dramatize, but don't worry, I'm not going to plot another story for you. But what you say about taking for granted our security is dangerously true. People like the Calvin Browns haven't caught up with events. To the citizen who has never been abroad, Europe is still over there. Just as to the untraveled European, America is vaguely over here. So to Calvin Coolidge, war is something remote, something which happens to the other fellow, like famine in China. Even in our last war, Mr. Stout, dearly as we paid in certain respects, it did not touch Calvin Cooley, uh, Brown as closely as the last war touched the European. All those forces contribute to the major problems which confront us in accelerating us to a fuller realization of the need to make quick and imperative decisions with regard to our national defense. Imbuing America with a virus of hate isn't going to do it. Enough of the commodity of hate has been loosed over the face of Europe already. What we Americans have to face is a family decision. How is the unit of our nation going to meet its supreme impending decision? Once the majority makes that decision, it's up to the entire family to stand by with 100% conformity. Personally, as the average man on the street, it's taken me a long time to make up my mind precisely where I stand in this unprecedented crisis in our history. And where do you stand, Miss Hurst? Well, sketchily, I'm prodigal. Give, give, give to Britain, aid to Britain, aid to Britain, aid to Britain. Then, and only then, should circumstances beyond our control sweep us into the inevitable... Down goes my last barrier, Mr. Stelt, and I follow up my country's chosen course. As an average American citizen, I'm about that definite by now. I think it is high time for every single American to be definite. Anyone who has traveled across the face of our country recently knows and becomes frightfully aware that some of the millions of Americans out there are not hearing the fire bells placidly, even a little smugly, they will tell you the fallacious whys, and all the time it is a conviction of our government that this conflagration has become the terrible, the imminent, the overwhelming concern of the American man and his wife in the American street. Thank you, Miss Hurst. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today has been Fanny Hurst. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. another